Lovely. Thank, right. thank you very much. Gina, the floor is yours. Good morning. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know, most of the issues have been outlined by our previous speaker with um, uh, broiler breeders. So I'm going to probably introduce a few more, but it really, the welfare concerns revolve around the increase in broiler breast meat deposition. In this picture here uh, on the left, I have our Athens Canadian random bred meat strain that's been unselected since the 50s. And on the uh, right, I have a Cobb 500 uh, this year. And um, at six weeks, you can just see the, the real difference between these strains um, and what we've done with this bird. And of course, you know, our U.S. consumer is focused on white meat. Uh, and these birds have been genetically bred to give us that white meat. And, you know, here's um, uh, just a picture of the carcasses uh, from these birds, so you can see a little bit clearly, but uh, the massive, you know, meat increase on these birds uh, really gives us some issues on the reproductive side. And here you can see we've frozen the carcass and cut down through it, and you can see uh, just the tremendous breast meat deposition. I always tell people that with the athletes, Canadian random bread, uh, a breast fillet is about two good bites of meat. So uh, in 60 plus years, uh, the geneticists and the nutritionists have done a great job uh, in improving uh, meat deposition in these birds, but gives us huge problems reproductively. Um, you know, we're really down around the 160 to 165 uh, hatching eggs on these birds in about 45, 44 weeks of lay. And um, in the United States, hatchability is hovering between about 79 and 80 percent uh, life of flock. And we do keep birds, uh, particularly post-COVID, we're, we're back to 64, 65 weeks of age. Uh, those last five weeks of lay are quite challenging uh, to get good fertility and hatchability. But again, lowers the overall hatch uh, tremendously on these birds. Um, you know, the, the genetically, these high yielding breeders today uh, have the tremendous ability to deposit breast meat and it impacts both livability and fertility. We have to limit nutrient intake on the breeder side at the parent level. Um, which causes, from a practical point of view, feed distribution problems. We don't have enough feed volume to put feed in front of all the birds unless we use a feeding program. Um, it's very hard under commercial conditions that we have in the United States where you're housing 10 to 12,000 breeder hens uh, in a lay facility. Uh, to get the feed distributed evenly on a um, concentrated type diet. Uh, so as in rearing, they have extensively used skip a day feeding to try to get feed uh, in front of all birds. And we'll go over this a little bit more, but again, industry is moving towards everyday feeding here in the United States, but it's a slow move because again, we, we have a uh, larger size housing than you'll find in other places in the world, which makes it more difficult to evenly distribute the feed unless you're using uh, high fiber diets. We still have a lot of conflict in our industry between whether we're going to grow these birds sex separate or commingled. Um, most integrators are using a sex separate system, but we still have uh, several, two or three large companies that are commingling. It's easier, uh, it's less expensive. Um, maybe it's a little bit more natural to grow them together. But sex separate gives you um, the proper feed and nutrients for each sex to meet their growth curve. 
we can improve coefficient of variation uh, with sex separate feeding as well. So, you know, this is a challenge because you're going to end up uh, with poor uniformity with commingling and you're going to lose uh, more birds on both ends uh, as far as uniformity. And we'll talk about that just a minute too. Slat height in these houses uh, in the U.S. has come down. We have lower and lower slat height which to me is a huge improvement uh, towards proper welfare for these birds. You know, slats, re we remove the birds from their own feces uh, to a certain extent. Most of our housing is two thirds slats, one third litter floor. So we're getting them away from their own contamination, which certainly is better health wise, hygiene wise, as well as, um, excuse me, as well as um, improving patch neck quality. But lowering the slats has reduced um, mortality reduced leg issues and injury, uh, again, in birds that have grown in size over the last uh, 50 years. So I think this is a, a big improvement uh, to our housing. Feathering in these hens. Um, feather cover uh, in rearing um, is very important for a long life. And for fertility. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for poor feathering in these birds. Some of it is nutrient consumption or uneven distribution of feed because we know my, uh, not only is protein, uh, methionine and cysteine important in these birds, uh, but many of the micronutrients like zinc are extremely important to feathering. And if we have uh, uneven feed distribution and consumption, it impacts feathering. Uh, we need to decrease over mating in these birds. We need to have the right sex ratio. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that. But if we don't uh, have proper sex ratio, we will have over mating and uh, really damage the feather cover on these females. Uh, housing issues, um, overheating can, can damage feather cover or uh, not keeping the house warm enough. Uh, again, the birds are gonna use the nutrients towards uh, maintenance versus making feathers. Uh, so these are huge challenges for us. We can't neglect the rooster, of course. Um, we have to manage the cockerel and the adult bird very closely. Uh, they have the same body weight and breast flushing issues as the females. So we are um, limiting their nutrient intake so that we can keep body weight where it needs to be, as well as body weight uniformity is a very important. Overweight and underweight birds really um, undermine our ability uh, to uh, provide the best care for these birds uh, and, and ultimately uh, for performance in these birds. Feet and leg issues uh, are always a problem. I tell folks that you know, you're not going to have much mating activity if you don't have good feet and legs with these uh, roosters. But mobility in the house to get to feed and water, you know, we have to look at those issues for both the female and the male. Bacterial contamination. It seems that we have more uh, bacterial or staph issues in roosters than we do in uh, hens. And again, uh, high mortality and lifelong or flock uh, throughout their life, we will see staph being an issue. We're also seeing uh, a new syndrome in these birds, and that's kind of uh, what we're calling a flabby heart syndrome uh, in adult uh, roosters. So let's dive into some of this. Okay, birds have a great appetite and feed efficiency because of genetic selection. We usually start feed restricting on a daily uh, level at seven days of age, seven to 14. Why do we restrict? We have to with the genetic potential of these birds. This has already been covered, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but if we don't feed restrict, we will have very low egg production and low fertility in 
patch um, and a lot higher mortality. This is some of Frank Robinson's work from the late 80s, but it really proves if they're feed restricted, we're gonna get about 175 eggs with this classic hen that he used versus those that are full fed. Um, you can see exactly why we have gone towards feed restricting these birds. But again, quality of life is much better for a feed restricted than a full fed bird with all sorts of feed and leg issues, as well as a high rate of heart attacks in these birds. Um, you will also have, as I said, lower mortality in the restricted birds versus the full fed, and you'll have fewer pause days or you have a better clutch length uh, in birds that are feed restricted. So both welfare and performance are often going together uh, in how we manage these birds for for uh, the optimum. So, you know, in feed restriction, we have uh, good restriction of the ovary. If we full feed, we have uh, no feed, we have no restriction of the ovary and we have ultimately peritonitis and a lot of multiple yoked eggs. So again, a lot of reasons that we feed restrict and uh, it is very important to the livability and welfare of these flocks. So again, Robinson's group uh, found that we regulate the ovary development with feed restriction, we get more normal egg production. So more normal shelled, fewer double yoked or abnormally shaped eggs. And it again goes with moderate feed restriction will help us have better overall egg production or uh, less egg loss. Can't neglect the rooster here. Uh, the uh, rooster on your uh, left is a full fed bird uh, at about 30 weeks of age, massive uh, breast uh, development in these birds. What we have to move towards is uh, the bird on on uh, your right there that has been feed restricted is not carrying near as much breast fleshing, uh, it's much more upright posture, uh, has much better ability to complete matings. Um, but again, uh, improved quality of life. So again, feed restriction starts early. I think this is more and more important uh, as uh, the geneticists improve the rate of gain that we not brawlerize these birds by allowing them to go three, four, five weeks on starter diet and unlimited consumption. Because again, if you do that, you have a broiler at four weeks, and then you're going to have to put that bird on an even more severe feed restriction to keep their body weight at a moderate level. So Early feed restriction, a limited daily amount, is helping us uh, keep these birds closer to a desirable weight uh, with less uh, feeding issues. Um, so we're going to put these birds probably at about 21 to 28 days. Uh, they're going to uh, go into some type of feeding system, and we're going to have to have a good feeding system to actually um, feed them. We need a, a, a feeder that's fast and can get the feed delivered. We don't wanna have bird migration or running around the house uh, with a lot of pickover or spillage of the feed. Um, we, we wanna make sure that everybody has the optimum ability to get to the feed that's available. So everybody's getting a more normal amount of feed. Um, we also need to match our feeder space to our feed feeder capability and amount of feed that's available um, to these flocks. So again, if we have a lot of feeder space and very little feed to put in it, that's not helpful uh, to uh, managing these birds. So we may have to have the ability to drop more feeder lines as the birds get larger and you have more feed volume available to them.
So again, feeding programs, which would be primarily here in the United States, a skip a day program. Why would we use that? It increases the volume of feed. So you're going to give a 2x amount of feed on that skip day versus a 1x on every day. It improves body weight uniformity. Uh, and um, some people years ago would continue it to first egg, but today we pretty much change at 21 weeks going to a daily amount of feed. But again, it's to give more volume. Uh, the other way around that is to take your feed and put a lot of filler in it. Um, that was not popular 30, 40, or 50 years ago. Today, we are looking at that and trying to determine how we can do that with our existing housing and equipment. Okay, let's look at some of this. Um, the feeder space and feed volume, you can see there, we got a lot of feeder space for these birds. Everything is good on the left-hand picture, but on the right, you don't have enough feeder space and the birds are crowding the feeder all over, all over each other. This is not um, going to produce a good flock. It's very stressful uh, to them, obviously. Uh, and again, our body weight uniformity is going to be way off. Uh, you also need to have enough volume of feed, as I said earlier. Here we've got plenty of feeder space, but we don't have enough volume to cover the entire feeder. So again, you have to look at this from several points of view to have the volume. We can take the same feed and put a filler in it, and it will stretch around the house. And again, we're all um, concerned about uniformity, whether it be for the boys or the girls. We have low weight, low weight cull birds and we have ma uh, males and females that are too heavy that are not going to make it very far in this production period. So how we're trying to manage them is to get as many birds in the middle that have good body weight, that low stress, um, and that will ultimately perform for the industry because it is a business for them uh, and they have to uh, be able to produce enough broilers uh, to meet the demand. Okay, let's talk about some of the everyday and skip a day work that's been done. Primarily, um, we've worked with the high yielding strains that are available in the US. So that would be a, a Cobb 500, a Cobb 700, and a, 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 a Ross 708. And um, I just tried to summarize with the short time here, but everyday feeding can work in our systems. We have several integrators that are trying it. Um, in our research, we found uh, that we have as good or better coefficient of variation with everyday feeding. Uh, but we have to use a low density feed. The people who have tried to use their same concentrated uh, pullet rearing diets, it's not going to work. Um, you can improve feed utilization. The small picture to the side is a picture of the jejunum. Um, and you can uh, see in some of our reports that uh, you have better uh, gut integrity uh, with the high fiber. And one of the questions earlier was, does the high fiber do damage? Well, I'm sure if you got it high enough, it would. But the, the off feed day does a tremendous amount of damage to the gut. And that is why almost always you will have better feed utilization, better body weight gain on the same diet if you feed it every day versus skip a day. Um, it alters the intestine of the pullet to feed them uh, on a skip a day basis. Everyday hens had more carcass fat as they approached um, their uh, photostimulation period. They had better bone density uh, at light stimulation. So we had uh, less leg issues. Everyday pullets uh, in, had better shell quality when they started to lay and particularly at the end of lay and better egg weight and hatch of fertile. So again, a lot of improvements with everyday feeding 
that, um, again, of course, our industry is interested in, but also the aspect of being able to feed them on an everyday basis and, and how it will improve the welfare of these birds. So again, rearing, are we going to manage them together or separately? Uh, here we have them separated. And we're going to, if we do that, we can have lower mortality uh, and better CVs. So again, uh, I believe that to be uh, a better method. We still rely upon natural mating uh, for broiler breeders um, the world over, really. There are certain places I'm aware of that are doing artificial insemination, uh, but the norm is still natural mating. Uh, these are some of the factors that affect natural mating, age, that body weight, the breast flushing, the sex ratio that we have in the house, the physical condition of their feet and legs. And then again, there is a lot of behavioral uh, differences, but the body size uh, and head appendages have a tremendous impact on the behavior in those houses. We really only impact these that are highlighted. We can't affect the age, and to a certain extent, we're not affecting the comb and waddle size, but body weight, sex ratio, and physical condition, uh, we as managers can impact. Um, Again, just to prove this is looking at uh, mating activity, and again, we have much more activity at the end of the day than we do throughout the day or beginning of the day, um, and important aspects to be looking at. Over, over mating of birds, we see some of this with um, uh, poor sexual development because of poor uniformity. But again, anytime you have these little huddles of birds, uh, we, we know that, that those females are fearful um, and uh, can lead to overmating uh, of, uh, of the hens in these flocks, which is not helpful. Again, um, once they learn to run, they will stay out of the way of the males what we're looking for, a properly managed flock, will have this good mixing throughout the day, even into the evening. And if we don't have that, we will have poor fertility, higher mortality in these flocks. Again, fertility is extremely important. I tell my undergraduate students here at UGA, we're not in the egg business. We're in the broiler business, and we get that from uh, high fertility flocks. So we're trying to manage for good egg production, of course, but good fertility for sure. Yes, let's talk about some cannibalism, feather pecking, you know, the light feather pecking. Uh, we typically have heard called feather licking in these birds, and it can start very early in their life uh, and uh, out of boredom and uh, lack of comfort and uh, oral satiation. You will definitely see uh, birds with feathers that look like this. Um, there are a lot of, of things I've relied on the leghorn literature to get uh, my fundamentals in this area and leghorns, um, we've been feeding a higher level of fiber too for many years and it really does reduce the licking, pulling and cannibalism. Uh, again, I realize that fiber is, is expensive. You wouldn't think so, but it is. And it adds cost to your feed as well as additional storage and transportation costs. So it's not without additional costs. Um, what influences feathering? There are a lot of influences is what I have learned. Some of it is dietary protein. Where we have poor uh, methionine cysteine consumption, we have poor for uh, poorer feathering overall. Lower body weight. If you try to keep these birds on too low a body weight, you will have worse feathering. Micronutrients, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you don't get good uniformity of intake, uh, you will have birds that have poorer feathers. Um, and again, this early nutrition and rearing is very important to feathering. 
um, some work that was done by Benton Hudson uh, as a graduate student at Auburn University. Um, birds have three sets of feathers if you read the literature and that second set is made in the rearing period. Uh, and the last set of feathers are finished as that bird comes into lay. If a pullet has rough feathering, as you see here in this picture on the left, she will have rough feathering as a, an adult bird. Uh, so uh, what we do in rearing has a tremendous impact on her feathering, whether it's nutrition, whether it's too high a density, whether it's improper temperature control in these houses, we have a big impact on feathering. And certainly pecking has an impact. That's the most obvious one. Um, these are some birds that are not in a good place. They have had a lot of feather loss. Um, fertility declines when an adult aged hen looks like this. She's gonna stay out of the way of the rooster. She's not not dumb at all. They're pretty smart birds uh, and you will have lower fertility. Um, we do have milling issues. This is an example that I got pulled into uh, where um, the soybean meal was being um, steamed at too high uh, temperature and it was breaking down some of the protein. So the birds had a protein deficiency and they were plucking the feathers off their own legs own thighs, uh, and they were consuming all the feathers on the floor. If you ever walk into a pullet house and there are no feathers on the floor, I start looking uh, for protein deficiency because there should be some small feathers still there. So again, overheated protein and many other milling issues can cause feather problems in these birds. Stress bars, again, uh, mentioned by our earlier speaker, uh, but certainly feed ingredient issues cause poor feathering, brittle feathers that break off uh, in, in these birds and leave them somewhat bare. So again, it's not, there's not one answer for feathering problems. We have to look for multiple issues. But again, if we have too high a sex ratio uh, at placement in these houses, it's much easier to just put all of the roosters in there, uh, 13, 14% but you've got about three or 4% too many roosters and it will cause overmating and fearful behavior uh, in these birds. So again, late in life, they often have fertility issues when they have been exposed to too high um, a male ratio. Uh, so again, poor feathering, we need to look at, uh, we'll know the impact of, on fertility, but we need to, to uh, figure out a way around this it is not, you're not going to solve the problem by adding more roosters, actually make it a lot worse. Um, and I always ask the farmers, um, you know, were these hens slatted at one time? Were they staying up on the slats? And oftentimes uh, they were, and um, you're seeing that problem late in life. So what about trying to feed them some additional grains or oyster shells to bring them down to the scratch area probably won't work with with hens that are this bare um, and I tell folks we're going to have to figure out how not to create this problem again again uh, we want really good mixing of these birds because that's the best opportunity for good mating activity if we have a bare floor at uh, six or seven o'clock in the evening um, when most of the actual mating is taking place, uh, we will have low overall fertility in the flock. So can't neglect my roosters. What are some goals uh, for them? We want to minimize the breast flushing. We still want a very healthy bird, but we need to minimize that breast flushing. What we're seeing here in the U.S. is that we have companies that are moving towards a male diet for the boys in the lay house so that we can limit that flushing. Again, upright posture in these birds, good libido, good feet and legs, and a lower mortality rate uh, in, in the male. We need to do everything we can to provide the best environment and nutrition for these birds.
Um, well, we need to look at testicides because that's directly related uh, to how these birds will perform. And obviously once we kill them, we can't put them all back together, but we do need to look at a certain number of them. So you know, if you are growing roosters that are going to give you maximum testicides that we look at, at about 30 weeks of age, we should be looking at something in the neighborhood of 35 to 50 gram total testis weight. And that we also wanna see how testis weight declines. So we will periodically kill more males uh, to look and see if we're able to maintain testis weight. Um, and here you have very good uniformity of testes, which again gives you a pretty good idea um, that uh, these birds um, are going to have good testis weight and good semen production throughout. And again, I look at body weight and testis weight and come up with a testis weight to body weight ratio. In all um, animals, we were looking for about a 1% testis to body weight. And if we have a great deal lower than that, we're probably not growing or maintaining testes well in these birds. Okay, just to summarize, I uh, wanna make sure we get everything in. Whoops, I touched that too quickly here. Sorry about that. Just to summarize, uh, we need to control that body weight for egg production and semen production and just the uh, welfare, livability of these birds. Uh, have uh, the best feed distribution will give us the best uniformity and best results. Sex separate um, uh, rearing of these birds uh, improves body weight uniformity and livability. Better feathered cover comes from uh, improved nutrient consumption. Less over mating is important and improved housing uh, for these flocks. Uh, we, we need to restrict breast flushing and overall body weight, uh, which will help us with our uniformity and sexual maturity of these birds. Um, fertility and longevity uh, of semen production uh, are important too. And again, all related to body weight. So we have to actively manage the time of uh, putting these birds in here and giving them a little bit of feed and not worrying about it is long gone. Uh, we have to be looking at livability, performance, and welfare. And they all go together. Um, if we are properly managing these birds, we will be optimizing all aspects uh, of the life of these birds. So again, I'm open to, to some questions and I appreciate your time today very much. Thank you, Gina. There are some questions in the Q&A, so I'll go over them. First question is, are there any integrators in the US uh, that use presentation feeding for pullets? I'm not sure, I don't know what that means, but. Oh. Um, <laughs> presentation feeding. Is it presentation or precision? It says presentation. presentation, but it could be precision. That may make more sense. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the question there, but um, most of these birds, um, the feeder comes on at the time of the lights coming on in rearing and in lay, I might add. Um, so uh, presentation feeding um, is normally done with, with uh, adult roosters where the feed is in the feeder at the time the lights come on. So yeah, I think that is what is meant the, the question asker that attendee says like feeding roosters. Is yeah, no, we, there will be some um, filling the feeder in the dark. We do have some of that particularly with cob strains which have an even more aggressive appetite pattern. Um, which just means that the feeder comes on before the light comes on. Mm -hmm. um, but the birds line up. They, you know, they're, again, very, very smart. They hear that feeder come on and they line up at the feeder. So um, I don't think you're really fooling them too much. So is there, do you see any benefit of having the feed already there before the lights come on? You have less um, movement of the birds, but again, I think the more important 
thing to be concentrating on is, do you have enough feeder space um, for everybody to eat? And do you have enough feed to distribute in that feeder space? Yeah. Um, and again, thinking about their age as small chicks, you don't have to have as much feeder space. So um, we're seeing more and more people move towards um, um, pan type feeders where they put down more lines as they get bigger so they can have more feeder space. Yeah. So speaking about feeding a little more, uh, you presented, uh, I believe if I interpreted correctly, there were some benefits to full feeding uh, birds uh, in one of your earlier slides, you showed, okay, egg production was, uh, or days in egg production was a little higher. There were some benefits related to full feeding compared to restricted feeding. Did I see that correctly? Uh, no, there, there are no improvements in egg production on full feeding. Okay, so and it's, it's all, yeah. primarily because of mortality. Um, and that work was done in the late 80s. Today, it would even be more drastic with a high yielding bird. Um, your mortality, your uh, peritonitis, um, just and feet and leg issues. Um, so, yeah, that the real benefit of, you know, feed restriction um, is is uh, reducing mortality. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, longevity of the bird, the old saying, um, dead birds don't lay eggs. Yeah, that's what that amounts to. Uh, uh, we did see or hear from you and from uh, earlier speakers that there are some benefits for, or let's say some impacts of animal welfare if, uh, because of the restricted feeding, right? Is there a sort of a happy medium in terms of uh, lack of negative welfare issues with feed restriction uh, and behavior, um, if you feed restrict them a little less. So if you give them a little bit more feed, okay, maybe there are gonna be some productivity issues, but maybe the welfare improves to such an extent that it could be worth it. You know, I think there are people looking at that right now. We we actually have one study going on where we are feeding a bit more feed um, through rearing and into lay. Um, and I know that there are industry people looking at the same um, issues. And I, I think it's key to maybe when you do that and how you do it um, and Again, I think it still has to be coupled with more fiber. Um, you know, I asked one time, uh, you know, why are we feeding such a concentrated diet? Well, I got the same answer you get for a lot of things in life. Well, that's what we've been doing. You mm -hmm. know, it, it's cheaper to haul a more concentrated diet. You have to have less um, bin space. Um, you know, you don't have to buy that fiber. Um, so, I mean, there's reasons, but they're not oriented towards the welfare of the bird. And I, you know, what my research has been uh, concentrating on is just trying to bring out the facets um, that improve um, the performance of the bird on everyday type feeding methods. Because without that, we're gonna have a hard time getting people to move. They, they just never realized that, hey, I can, I can still have good performance. I can still do the right things for the bird. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things I bring up to them as well is the fact that our old methods of, of um, skip a day feeding are not working as well on a high yielding bird. You have more and more flocks that just are not performing very well. Mm -hmm. um, and if you back up and it's, it's likely related to they have poor uniformity coming out of the pullet house and it's, it's due to poor feed distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so again, as reminding people of, that we could do a lot of, of positive um, improvements um, by you know, doing something like everyday feeding with a high fiber diet. Thank you. 
Uh, speaking a bit about feathering, there are some questions there. Do you think uh, that high stocking densities can contribute to poor feathering and any thoughts about optimal density for females, either in rearing or in lay? Density, um, both in broilers, um, broiler breeders, and I do believe uh, commercial turkeys uh, have a tremendous impact on feathering uh, from what I have read in the literature. Um, and have seen with my own eyes, the, the higher the stocking density, the poorer the feathering. There's pretty direct relationship there. Um, but what, what would be optimum? Um, you know, if, if money was no issue, we would have very low stocking densities, but um, we have to get something in a practical range. And, you know, what I have seen work quite well, and I'm not going to be able to do it on the meters square here, but um, if, if we can be in the 1.6 square foot per pullet, 1.7 something in that name uh, area, we'll do extremely well. Even in the 1.5 uh, square foot per pullet, you're, you're doing well. Uh, for these birds. Again, for them, feeder space is, is probably more key than actual floor space. Um, in the hen house, if you can be in the 1.8 to 1.9 square foot per bird, um, that's again uh, providing uh, good um, space for them. And what's important to them again is feeder space and nesting space. Um, I was very intrigued with the perching. Uh, we do uh, provide perches in rearing for our, our birds. Um, and I, I think that that is great. Um, haven't gone to providing perches in the hen house, um, but I think that could very easily be done and would improve their welfare because they do have that natural instinct of wanting to perch. Mm -hmm. Um, a little more about the, the feathering. Uh, some researchers believe that excessive uh, feather licking is caused or related to a redirected foraging behavior in broiler breeders. Do you believe that this uh, may be the main cause or a major contributor uh, as why this behavior is predominantly seen in broiler breeders when compared to laying hens? I, I definitely believe that that feed restriction is involved uh, with these birds. I can't I wish I could quote the uh, author on this, but there's some new work out that looks at um, even um, again goes along with uh, feed deprivation or uh, low fiber intake where the gut is um, is getting some um, signals. Uh, to the or is giving signals to the brain uh, over how distended the gut is, and they are um, saying that that's uh, po more positive welfare. So the bird is getting some feedback uh, when they don't get enough gut fill um, that is leading to um, you know uh, bad. Uh, welfare conditions for the birds. So again, if they're not getting enough to eat, they're not even getting enough uh, to distend the gut to a certain level. It is playing into poor welfare and they are going to seek some sort of oral satiation. Uh, we see a lot of uh, litter eating. You know, I talk to people about fiber. Um, well, they're getting their fiber because they're eating the litter off the floor. Um, there's usually very little litter left in these houses. So maybe we ought to feed it to them and the feeder uh, would, would be a better choice. Um, but again, I, I believe that that is involved in what, what we're seeing mm -hmm. uh, in these birds. Yeah. Um, a little bit about the, the mating behavior and aggression. Um, is there any indication that genetic companies or researchers are uh, looking into selecting for roosters that are mid, maybe a bit more gentle in their uh, mating behavior, more gentle temperament towards females? You know, I, I am not privileged to that sort of information <laughs> at all. Um, 
So, you know, I, I will say over the years, you see differences in mating interest in uh, aggression um, in different lines of males. I don't know if it's intentional or not. I'm, my gut feeling there is it's coincidental uh, that we see differences in uh, mating uh, or male aggression. Um, I will say too that to a certain extent, the more feed restricted the rooster is, the more, um, um, I wouldn't say gentle, but um, uh, we don't see roosters um, at least injuring each other as much if they are more in line with, with the rest of the roosters in the flock. So in other words, if we have more uniform males, we don't tend to have as much uh, at least male on male aggression. Uh, because they're more equals. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that as, as being having a positive impact uh, on just the life in the house and um, mating activity. Uh, maybe our last question for now, but please feel free to like type your answers to questions that are unanswered uh, around flock spiking. And it's sort of related to what you just mentioned. Um, do you see an impact of uh, spiking flocks with younger males on both the females, so maybe they show more fear responses, and on the males? So, uh, for instance, maybe they get more targeted aggression from the existing males in the flock. You know, we we um, will see um, multiple spike or additions of males to flocks, particularly because we're keeping the birds to 65 weeks of age. If you are keeping them a shorter period of time, you may not need to spike as often uh, as we uh, have seen here in the United States. You will see some aggression um, of um, the older males on the younger males when you put your spike males in. I usually caution people to make sure that the spike males uh, weigh at least 25% more than the females they're going to. Uh, a, because you want them to be recognized as a mating partner and B, uh, you want them to be able to 